Romans chapter 8. Very familiar portion of scripture to most born again believers. Romans chapter 8. We're going to begin at verse 1, and uh, I'm going to be reading today from the King James, good old-fashioned King James, okay? Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 1, and if we would all stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, did you hear me, children? What the law could not do, in that it was weak, through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Is Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. I want to speak to us today on the topic of rebuke the seamstress. I bet you don't see anywhere where I'm going with that in what we just read, do you? But we'll get there. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, once again, we just come before you at this hour as the Word of God is about to be sent forth. Lord, you... Your word declares that the word of God does not go out void, but it always performs what it's set forth to do. And Master, today, as the people of the Spirit, and not as a people of flesh, not as a people of tradition, not as a people of religion, but as a people who rely heavily upon your living Spirit, your resurrected presence in the midst of us, we ask, God, that your anointing and your presence and your power would rest upon your word this hour. Lord, that it would rest upon your messenger this hour. God, that I might deliver it in a manner that will bring glory to the cross of Calvary. And Lord, in a manner that will lift up the name of Jesus. For we ask it, Master, today, in none other name than the lovely name of Jesus, to whom be all glory and honor. Amen and amen. You may be seated today. Praise God, amen. You know, there are some professions in this life that you, you just look at the person who does that kind of work and sometimes you, you cannot understand how or why they would want to do the kind of work they do, you know, like maybe a mortician. Like very many of us that could find our way clear to feeling comfortable having to work with dead bodies and work with mourning, grieving families. And uh, there are those that work in EMS who uh, go out to accidents where people are miserably, horribly maimed and injured and bruised and dying and dead. And they have to pick up the pieces and try with all of their knowledge and might to try to put things back together again. But then you have those who choose professions and they make a sport of things that we find reprehensible. For instance, the mafia.
must be a hitman who goes out and at the order of his boss, knocks off, you know, kills off any individual that his don or that his boss tells him he wants knocked off or he wants killed. And there are many professions that we look at and, and we don't find them very tasteful and we're not really crazy about them. And I have found a new one today. In preparing for this message, I found a brand new profession that a lot of Christian people seem to go into, and I'm not crazy about this profession anymore. I remember when I was working as Jiggle, the Christian clown, in children's ministry in the Assemblies of God years ago, I had to hire one of these people. She looked okay. She looked harmless enough. I think she might have been a good one, you know. Every once in a while, you're thinking a good one. But I needed a new costume for Jiggle, and I designed one, and I had it all drawn on paper how I wanted it made, and I even went to the local store, which at the time, I can't remember whether it was Kings or Ames or what it was, but bought some fabric. I had the material to give this lady, so all she had to do was put it together, you know, and, and figure it out. But that's her job. She's a seamstress. And you say, well, Brother Mora, what in the world's wrong with a seamstress? <laughs> How can you find anything wrong with a seamstress? I'm going to explain to you momentarily, but children, there are some things that do not need to be sewn. And there are a lot of people in churches today that are trying to sew up something that God himself tore down. You hear me now? Amen. Now listen, we, as we were reading our text today, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul makes the comment for what the law could not do. He didn't say what the law did not do. He said what the law did not do. It was impossible. Why? Because the law relied upon the efforts and abilities of human beings. That's why the law was weak in the flesh and is capable of doing for us what needed to be done. And that is also why God revealed himself to us in our own fallen, sinful state of existence so that he could do in the flesh what the law could not do. Hallelujah. Whew, that's an exciting thought. But then I see something for all of us in this portion that we read today in verse 6 that Paul admonishes us for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace peace boy there's a word how many people run through life how many people will fill up the bar rooms along Cedar Springs this evening because they're not looking for a bus but they're looking for peace Amen. Peace is something. When it comes time for you to face your grandchildren, I've got news for you. You're going to wish you had peace. There's a lot of people that think that life is for the living and they don't give any thought to the reality that we will one day face the righteous judge. Amen. We will one day stand before God. They don't want to deal with that reality. They don't want to deal with that. And the sad thing is, when the hour of their passing comes, they'll pass it with terror and fear and with deep. I remember laying in my hospital bed three years ago. I honestly, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember anybody ever. It, it, so, so much of it has kind of been washed from my memory for a variety of reasons. But mom talked to me about it and she said, Do you remember me saying to you, Are you ready? Did you ask me? Laurel did. Or am I afraid? And what did I answer? (laughs) 
You see, because the letter was frame of mind you're in. When you know each other, my son, no more, cause you're a high glory to God. When you know what you know, what you know, what you know, what you know, you got peace, amen. <laughs> and there's no fear on the inside. I can honestly tell you, I was not afraid. The, the fear of death wasn't there. The only thing I was afraid of was leaving something undone. I remember twice it felt like the Spirit of the Lord was just taking me home. Twice on two different occasions. And I felt my, my life leaving my body. And I mean, it was the weirdest sensation. I've never felt anything like this in my entire life. And I, I felt the life just leaving the body. I could feel the Spirit separating. And all of a sudden I cried out, Lord, no, what will my church do? Because I wasn't afraid to die, but I was afraid to leave those people without a pastor. I had a work, I had a ministry, I had something to do here. And twice I did that. And after the second time, the Lord said, if I ask you again, you'd better be sure. And I remember on that bed making up my mind, if he asked me again, that I would say, no, Lord. Because I kept coming to the place where I was so tired and so fatigued and so weary emotionally that I felt like it would be better to die than to live. And I said, Lord, maybe you should just take me. And then he started to. And then just about then I changed my mind and said, but Lord, I've got a work to do. And after doing that twice, he said, now make sure next time you're sure. Because next time I'm not going to let you change your mind. But really, I think what God was trying to do was trying to get me refocused a little bit on what my life was about and what I'm supposed to be doing here. And so, the reality is to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You want life, you want peace, then get in the spirit, amen. Find this thing we talk about, good old-fashioned Holy Ghost religion, and it will do wonders for you. Why? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The carnal mind, the natural human flesh and blood mind, works against God. Why do you think there are so many legions of brainiacs in our society who call themselves atheists? And what are they without fail? Scientists. Am I right? (laughs) Astronomers. Astrologists. All the people who can't see God are the ones who let their brain do the talking. But the carnal mind is the enemy of God. It works against God. And to be carnally minded is death. That can be spiritually minded of life and peace. But the Bible says that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It can't be. The reason that so many people are walking about confused, feeling condemned, and some are even hating God today, is simply because they've never allowed their carnal mind to yield to the spiritual mind which can only come through total surrender to the leadership of God's great Holy Ghost. Amen. As long as we keep trying to see and understand things from our perspective, we will have no peace. We will have no joy, and we will not have that blessed assurance we sing about. Children, I've got news for you. One of the things God finally had to teach me, and it took a long time, was to look at myself and who I was and what I was all about and understand it from his perspective. Because for the longest time, I was looking at it from a carnal perspective. And God said to me, carnally minded is 
to get past that carnal mentality. We've got to get past letting our mind dictate to us what reality is and what reality is not. There are enough things in life that constantly occur in the spirit world and in the scientific world and in the astrological world and all these different places that make people question what we think reality is. There are black holes in outer space that they can only guesstimate what it might be. They can only develop theories as to what that black hole is. Because nothing can get close enough to it without being sucked into it. And they, they don't have any data, they don't have any first hand experience. Children, you gotta get out of the kernel and get into the spiritual. You gotta quit thinking in your own mindset and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I still haven't gotten to why I want to rebuke the seamstress. Matthew 27, verses 50 through 54, we read part of the account of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Oh, glory to God. And behold, all oh, precious Lord, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Did you hear me, children? And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, or rent, uh, rent in two, it was torn in half from top to bottom, and the earth did twain. And the rocks ripped or broke, and the graves were opened. And many bodies, bodies, bodies of the saints which slept or were dead arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. That's after the resurrection. You see, when Jesus, woo, I'm going to shout a little today, okay? When Jesus said, it is finished, hallelujah, oh God, the hand of God, you see, on the cross, God was satisfying a contract that he had made with humanity. But upon speaking the word, it is finished, that contract was completed, and having been completed, the fingers of God reached down and grabbed hold of the, the veil of the temple which had separated humanity from his holy of holy place, and he tore it down the center for all of time and eternity, never again for you and I to be kept away from him, never again for there to be a division. Never again for anybody to be able to say to you that you don't have access to God. Woo! Glory. After all, when you satisfy a contract from both parties, that means that contract is no longer valid. It's useless. It means nothing. And what do you do with something that is invalid and useless and worthless? You tear it up and you throw it away. Hallelujah. And the veil of the temple represented the old contract. Hallelujah. And God tore that contract right down the middle. Glory to God. The Bible said it was such a powerful event. <laughs> That when the Lord declared it is finished, graves were open. Imagine what a terrifying sight that must have been. You've got an earthquake hit. All of a sudden, all these coffins start popping up all over the place. Three days later, they had the 
even gotten all those people reburied. They haven't even got everybody buried like they need to be buried. Because all these, all these graves open when the Lord declares it is finished. And the Jews have very strict guidelines as to how they're able to handle dead bodies. They can't just rush in there and do things any old way. They've got to be very, according to the law, they had to be very strict and very careful how they handled these things. So three days later, ha <laughs> ha oh yes, you know where I'm going. Three days later, when the angel of the Lord come down and moved that stone and said, Lord, come on out. Another very powerful event. And suddenly, lifeless bodies which had been dead and buried suddenly received life again. The Bible does not say that their ghosts wandered through Jerusalem. It says that their bodies received life and they began to walk through Jerusalem again. And I'm here to tell you that's how Jesus rose from the dead. His body received life and he got up and he walked out of the tomb. If anybody tells you any different, it's a fool and a liar. Why in the world would God put new life in dead bodies in the graveyards outside of Jerusalem? And yet he caused his own flesh and blood vessel that he had used to hold himself. And he would cause it nearly to evaporate so that he could emerge a spirit being. Don't make any sense, does it? My Bible said he led captivity captive. My Bible says that he was the firstborn among the resurrected. He did it the same way for himself that he's going to do it for you and I. Amen. Praise God and amen. Whew. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Honey, when you see an earthquake, when somebody says three words, and all of a sudden the sky is blackened and you hear thunder, and the earth begins to shake, and graves begin to spew coffins out all over the place, I've got news for you. It's pretty easy to figure out that maybe, just maybe, you have just crucified Messiah. Maybe, just maybe, the man on that cross was more than you thought he was. In John's account of the same event, John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, after this, listen carefully, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, meaning what? Jesus knowing that everything was done to fulfill every iota, every portion, every part of God's Word. He wouldn't leave an earth till it was. He said, if I thirst, now there was sent a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with the vinegar and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed and his head and he gave up the ghost. Amen. I'm trying to bring the two accounts of the uh, crucifixion together so that you can see a kind of a timetable. When the Lord said it is finished, that's when he died. That's when he gave up the ghost. That's when the, all the occurrences followed. The darkening of the skies, the earthquake, the graves open, so on and so forth. But I want you to understand today the full impact of the veil in the temple being rent in twain. In Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through 7, the Apostle Paul writes, Then verily the first covenant for the first contract had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first 
wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which hath the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables are the tablets of the covenant, and over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went only into the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God, but into the second went the high priest alone. Once every year, not without blood, meaning he had to carry a sacrifice, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Children, the truth today is this. God created an imperfect device which we call the law. The real purpose of that device was to help humanity to realize that we needed God. That was the whole purpose of the law, in a nutshell. Now, then God himself, being perfect in every way, fulfilled the terms of that contract, the law, and forever removed the barrier that stood between humanity and himself. Hallelujah. God himself did it. And for those that think that Jesus Christ was not God, that this is some invention of contemporary Christianity, I point you back to the prophecy of the Old Testament. <clears throat> Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 45, 21 and 23, Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient times? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. A just God and a Savior, there is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. The word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness. Love now, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. He said, I spoke it, and it came to pass. Hallelujah. And shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. See, I know a verse in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul, based on this scripture, declares that one day before the Lord Jesus Christ, every tongue shall confess, and every knee shall bow. Hmm. Yes, you see, God came. Our God came. I don't know what your God did. I know what my God did. He came and fulfilled the terms of this contract that he had made with humanity. At the time of Adam's fall, the overhead that I have before you today states, you can't see all of it. I didn't realize it would be so big. But it states that this is a contract between the Lord God Jehovah and humanity. And it states, having failed to honor the terms 
of our earlier agreement in the Garden of Eden, upon the successful completion of one man's sinless and blameless life, humanity having provided sufficient evidence of its desire to spend eternity with me, I, the Lord God Jehovah, will remove the veil. Hallelujah. <laughs> that separates the human race from myself. Glory to God. And it was Jehovah God who came and did just that. Hosea 13 and 4. Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. For there is no Savior beside me. Oh, but now listen to this, children. Listen to what the Apostle Titus writes in Titus. Titus 2, 11 through 14, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of who? Who's coming out of that? Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He is both one and the same. Glory to God. He's neither just God nor just Savior. He's both. Hallelujah. God didn't send somebody to do the work of the Savior. He came and saved for himself. Glory to God. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He didn't come to do something for somebody else. He came to do it for himself. Hallelujah. All in one instant in time, the body that is placed host to God Almighty hung lifeless on the cross of Calvary, a perfect and complete satisfaction of the contractual obligation humanity had with God. Did you hear me? I didn't say the contract that God had with uh, humanity. No, it's the contractual obligation that humanity had with God. That's why God had to become human to satisfy us. Because he was doing it on our behalf. <laughs> but God became flesh so that he could satisfy the terms of the contract on our behalf. Isn't that glorious? What a marvelous, incredible, glorious thought. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'll read it from the New King James Version, 16 through 21. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, Paul says. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus, no longer. He said, yeah, we knew the Lord as a man, but once all this thing was finished, and now that he's where he is and wherever we are, now we know who he is and we don't look at him the same way. Our whole position has changed. Amen. They weren't looking at him the same way they were when they could look at him as a human being. No, God, no. But listen to what Paul goes on to say. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, or that is to say, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, <laughs> not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Now I want to read from the Revised Standard Version, two verses here, verses 16 and 17, because you might have missed a little piece of meaning that's meaty and important. Paul said, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once regarded Christ from a human point of view, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You see, when somebody comes into the church, Paul said, from now on, you don't regard anybody after the flesh. You don't regard anybody from a human point of view. Anybody. Amen. Guess who that includes? You. Because notice he immediately follows with, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Former things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That means that your mindset has changed. That means that your carnal mind is tossed out with the trash and your spiritual mind has replaced it and therefore you look at everything different. Somebody said to me once, how, how can you say everything becomes new? When I got saved, my eye color didn't change. My weight didn't change. My hair color didn't change. Everything didn't become new. No, but your mind did and now the way you see everything does look different. Everything's new. Hallelujah. Somebody can go through a, a near-death experience like I did in the hospital and come out of it and all of a sudden you appreciate things in the world that you never even knew were there before, but you passed them every day you saw them all the time. It's not the things that have changed, but it's you that has changed. It's you that has become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And therefore the way you see things, the way you judge things, the way you look at things is different. And we as children of God are no longer supposed to regard anyone from a human point of view. We're supposed to look at them and regard them from God's point of view. Jesus Christ has fixed the problem of our separation from God by tearing into the veil that once separated us from Him. There is no longer separation. There is no more separation. There is no more uh, limited access. But now we have general, unlimited, unobstructed access to God. Romans 8, 31 to 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Think about it, devil. You hearing me, children? Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who dies, and furthermore, it's also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes, uh, also makes intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of God. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sorrow, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are no more, excuse me, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Oh, I 
which we fought like Paul did. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So I've got news for all those churches full of seamstresses that are trying to sew up the veil of the temple, that are trying to put a division between God and his people, that are trying to put the law back into effect. That contract has been torn. Put your needle away there, Miss Jesus. You're an enemy of the cross. You're an enemy of the gospel. When you say that someone is weak and try to discourage them from serving and knowing God, you, my friend, are on the opposite team. Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. So enemies of the cross and destroyers of men's souls, put away your swords. Put away your sewing thread and needle, your devices and tools of separation and destruction. For I have news for you. God is on our side. <laughs> he is on our side. We are more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors. If God be for us, who can be against us? You can make all the noise you want to. You can scream and holler all you want to. You can preach your kids up till blood pours out your pores. But God is on our side. He's done the work. <laughs> and you cannot nullify it. He tore that contract, and honey, they don't make enough thread, and they don't make a needle big enough for you to go against God and put that veil of separation back up. Our access is guaranteed. You can't repair you can't repair the veil. You can't dig a ditch. You can't slaughter our crops or destroy our crops in an effort to separate us from the love of God because the barrier has fallen. <laughs> and here's the best part. <laughs> Once and for all, and it shall never be raised again. Hallelujah. Amen. It shall never be raised again. The veil is down. It will never hang again. It will never go up again. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Would you stand with me today? Amen. I don't know about you, but I felt like that was a powerful, wonderful word of revelation. Amen. Amen. Mm. Oh, how long will they not see, saith the Lord, when I have so vividly revealed myself to them? How long will they choose to close their eyes and not see? For I declare unto you the brightness of my glory is so great that even with your eyes closed I am able to reveal myself to you and you cannot deny it. For I am God. That is my name. I am Jesus. I declared myself to Paul. And I declare myself to you this hour. Know me this day. And know peace. Know me this day. And know salvation. For I am God, saith the Almighty. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, glory to God in the name of the Lord. 
Praise God, amen, praise God, amen. The veil of the temple has been rent, and God wants you to know today who he is. He tore that curtain down. He doesn't have to hide.